Hi, I'm Ann DeLisi. And I'm Chef James Regato. And on this episode of Essential Cooking, we talk with Henry Ford Hospital doctors Ed Zarati, Division Head for Allergy and Immunology, and Dr. John Deletta, Chairperson for the Department of Emergency Medicine, about the science and misconceptions about food allergies. Here's that informative and fascinating conversation. All right, well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. This is a, a very interesting topic to me. I think the public will be interested as well. Um, we're deep diving on food and allergies. So, Anne, please chime in because I'm probably going to get carried away because <laughs> okay. I got a lot of questions. I got yeah. 25 years of catering to allergies, and I have a lot of questions <laughs> for two experts on the subject. So um, I guess for one, I want to know, you know, just overall, have you guys as doctors recognized an increase in food allergies in Americans over the last couple decades? Well, thanks for uh, having us, James. You know, on an individual basis and just in your clinic, it's hard to pick up when there's differences in the prevalence of diseases. And part of that is referral patterns change, so you may get more of one type of patient. For instance, we had some specialists in food allergy, so over the last few years we have seen a lot more food allergy, but it may be related to that expertise. Um, I think a relevant question is really what kind of scientific studies there are that suggest that they're going up. And those can be flawed a little bit as well. So most of the studies that we look at are epidemiologic studies. And in those studies, they ask questions in surveys, and they ask them in different ways. So they may ask the question such as, you know, do you or do your child have food allergies? So it's very vague, and actually the definition of food allergy uh, can vary quite a bit. Anything from I've had patients come in and tell me, oh, when I eat fried food, you know, I get uh, heartburn. Uh, they may consider that a food allergy. Uh, from the standpoint of when a physician really thinks of food allergy, they're usually attributing it to something called immediate hypersensitivity or an immune response um, to that food where the immune system recognizes something foreign, like a protein in a food, and then the reaction of the immune system causes some type of a harmful side effect. John, what about you? And you're more of an ER-focused uh, physician. So you, are you seeing an increase in food allergies in the ER at all? Uh, so first, thanks for having us here today as well. Um, yes, from an emergency department standpoint, over the past 20 years, we have certainly seen uh, an increased frequency of presentations that have something to do with an insensitivity to something, in this case, food. And uh, for the most part, when you see patients in the emergency department that present claiming a food allergy, it's typically shellfish or peanuts in that regard. And so something in that, uh, within those two buckets, uh, we certainly, over the last 20 years, have seen an increased frequency of presentations of, uh, of food allergy or food intolerance. So, John, if I could just chime in on that, too. So he brought up shellfish and peanut, and um, we'll probably be talking about that a little bit later as well. But peanut seems to specifically has been a problem, particularly kind of in the new millennium in that first decade. There was a lot of the epidemiologic studies actually show about a doubling of the peanut sensitivity, and there may be some reasons that we're starting to uncover why that was the case. But for some specific foods like peanut, it does look like maybe it's evened out at this point, um, but there was an increase uh, earlier in the millennium. And do you have any idea yet why that was, why that happened? Um, there was a really kind of a paradigm-changing study. So part of this we can almost blame on uh, the, the medical community in general, and that when children were young, we were having them avoid highly allergenic foods, um, including peanut. And then there was a, a particular uh, allergist. He had uh, been in Israel, uh, and uh, his name is Gideon Lack, and he had moved to the United Kingdom. And so what he had recognized is that um, children in the United Kingdom that were <laughs> of Jewish lineage were having a lot of peanut allergy. In fact, 10 times the amount of peanut allergy as children uh, in Israel. And they kind of had a, a snack that contained peanut protein and it was called bamba. And the Jewish children, it was almost a, a, a cultural um, uh, type activity that they would feed their young children these, these uh, peanut puffs is basically where there's like a cheese puff, except there was peanut protein in it. And he thought, could these things be related? So that triggered, again, this uh, really interesting study. It was called the LEAP study, or Learning Early About Peanuts, um, that our NIH funded. And a lot of it was actually done in the United Kingdom. Um, but what they did was they randomized patients to either 
continue avoiding peanut when they were very young in their first year of life. In other ones, they started feeding them peanut if they were high-risk individuals. So in both groups, you either had to have bad eczema or already have an egg allergy, which puts you on a path um, a little bit later about <coughs> developing peanut allergy. And what they found was in those children that they randomized to feeding peanut at about four to six months of age and had them do it routinely through that time, they decreased the incidence of peanut allergy by 80 percent at the age of five. So it really – it changed uh, uh, really both the pediatricians as well as the allergists. And now the focus is on, wow, if you have a child when your immune system is still plastic – um, to go ahead and feed those highly um, allergic foods very early because it looks like that's part of the education of the immune system and a- being able to tolerate those foods. So you were talking about the development of the immune system. How mm-hmm. long – what period of time is that after you're born that that mm-hmm. gets that, – That's a, qu- uh, a, a great question. We really think the key is in the first year of life. And um, we think it's actually linked to how our gut – bacteria develop as well. So that's kind of a real hot topic right now. And it it has to do with some of the research that we do more for asthma than for food allergy. Um, But there is actually a programmed process of how the bacteria in our gut begin to develop. Is that in the womb or after? (laughs) That's a really good question. People are starting to look at that now, even placental bacteria. But it looks like it's mostly Um, after you're born. And there may be some very important exposures that occur. One of them being we're finding differences in allergy between children um, who were born vaginally or were born by C-section because that short little trip down the birth canal um, is the first inoculation of the baby and the bacteria that will eventually grow into their gut. And we think that that's extremely important. And then the next thing, as you can imagine, is breastfeeding as well. So mm-hmm. there's certain sugars and, and uh, fats in breast milk that seem to promote kind of a good bacteria in the gut. And we think that that's closely related to developing any allergy, but also food allergy. And some studies have uh, already shown that the infant, it's called the gut microbiome, those bacteria, is different between children who've developed allergy and children who have not. There's still a little bit about the chicken and the egg. Did the allergy drive the bacteria or did the bacteria drive the allergy? Is there, for, for children that are born via C-section, is there a way to capture any of what they missed had it been a vaginal birth to get that into their body? Well, we know one of the key or keystone bacteria is called lactobacillus, mm-hmm. and that's what the vaginal tract is full of. And, and actually, it's, you know, it's, it's amazing to look at this. Uh, but it looks like the bacteria that grow in a, in a woman's vaginal tract mm-hmm. actually change during pregnancy as well to supplement or enhance the amount of lactobacillus. And it's, it's still not known, but it is known that that's an early keystone bacteria that drives the subsequent development of the gastrointestinal tract. Interesting. So it, it sounds like for, for, for the first year of life, exposure is, is critical. Now, with allergies that I would say aren't anaphylactic at the point of adulthood or teenage years or beyond, um, does exposure therapy work? Like if somebody you know has a scratchy throat when they're eating shrimp, can they small dose themselves to basically being immune? The idea is fantastic. The uh, operationalizing of that is very difficult (laughs) because obviously there will be people who their allergy may progress and it could be very dangerous. So I think what you're talking to is very uh, similar to something called oral immunotherapy for food allergies that actually even some allergists in our community, um, we're not we are, are not involved in that at Henry Ford, um, but they're trying to introduce um, these foods in someone who's allergic. So there's a big difference between preventing disease, which is what that LEAP trial would, would, I was talking about. Once you're allergic, there is the chance on a bad day um, that you may not tolerate the food so well. So, you know, things that we know that will be make you more likely to react are things like exercise. Things like taking certain medications like, you know, Motrin and those types of medications, alcohol, um, and being ill. They all kind of rev up your immune response, including possibly a uh, severe allergic response as well. So it's a really tricky business, um, but it's uh, being done in the community in some cases and also in research. And what they do is they start at really teeny tiny doses and have you take those doses uh, for a week or so, and then you step up. To, to higher ones until you get a um, at least what would be kind of a accidental uh, 
type of exposure. So you get to that point. So there's two goals of that oral immunotherapy. The first is to raise that threshold. So how much peanut can you actually eat before you have a problem? And then there's kind of the holy grail or the gold standard. And that's that, boy, it would be great if we could cure peanut allergy. And people are looking into that now. And there are from early studies, some of them that aren't really quite even published yet, um, it looks like a lot of people, almost the vast majority of people, you can get to that kind of bite-sized protection level. But when you pull it away, some of them will become resensitized, and then you have to start the process over, or they're more sensitized to the small amounts. But in some people, they have what's called sustained um, unresponsiveness, where they can stop it for a month or two, and they did this in that peanut uh, study as well, and they 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 um, won't react even to like normal wow. diet type doses. So I want to pivot a little bit from the peanut <clears throat> here because you know celiac disease. Uh, for one, who is responsible for the, this boom? Um, <laughs> and then do you find this is a multi, this is kind of multi parts? So like who is who can I blame? And then uh, <laughs> is and I've heard theories from mostly from chefs because you know obviously we're you know I feel like we're on the front lines of you know eating right I mean we we see the people somebody will find a trend and then they'll go to the doctor and complain but I feel like chefs we're dealing with it on site and we're dealing with the people who are self diagnosing and and so on and I've read and I've discussed this with many chefs bakers people that use sourdough whole grains freshly milled flours etc um, is there a connection to that worsening? or uh, being a benefit to those with celiac. For instance, if you use a sourdough and not commercially active yeast and uh, natural grain, can somebody with celiacs handle that better or digest it better? Than, or you know, do you find a correlation with the flour and the processing and the American approach to bread versus you know, the old world style? So, so first, I, I, I noticed when you said who is responsible. <laughs> I don't want to particular I'm blame teasing, on you. <laughs> he was um, looking at you too. <laughs> but, but, I, but I do, I do think that that's uh, an interesting question because because uh, there may be um, some kind of overpopularity at this point of gluten sensitivity. And I think what's important um, again to distinguish is two things, and that's true celiac disease, um, where what happens is a particular protein, um, it's called gluten, and a sub part of that uh, is gliadin, um, starts to become recognized by your immune system. And that will kind of destroy especially the um, early parts of your digestive tract uh, in the duodenum. Um, that inflammatory response, interestingly, is really, really closely linked to your genetics. So there are certain genes um, that uh, people can carry um, that make it more likely when you digest uh, uh, the uh, gluten um, that it will be recognized by the immune system. And kind of these are the same thing. They're called HLA antigens. They're the same thing that's important in who's going to reject this tissue when you have a transplant. Okay, well, this is more like who's going to reject gluten when they get it. So it's really very similar to that idea. And it really doesn't look like the incidence of that has changed all that much. In fact, again, in the epidemiologic studies, which, as we discussed, are a little bit flawed sometimes, but it's usually running about 1 to 1, 1.5% uh, 1 um, of the U.S. population. And that was pretty stable from, I think it was 2004 until 2014, about over that decade. Right, but I guess my... I, what is it not in the U.S.? Because when you go to other countries, I mean, I travel, I don't know, mm -hmm. about 15 countries over the last 10 years, you just don't see it. I mean, I mean and it's yep. there. Italy's making more compromises because of tourism, I believe. And there are okay. obviously natives in Italy that have, you know, mm -hmm. celiac. I mean, I, I believe that celiac exists, but the, the American situation with it seems to be so much more grand. Yeah. And it, do you attach that to, like, people's obsession with weight loss in America or our food system being kind of – uh, tainted with, you know, a lot of processing, you know, and, and, and just an unhealthy relationship in general? Those, those could be some factors. I don't think they're scientifically proven yet, but the more exposure that you have, so sometimes the exposure levels are very important where, you know, a small amount is okay, larger exposure, and whether the foods or the, the uh, way that the gluten is mixed in with the other food or preparation uh, makes a difference. I don't, I don't think that's well known, but what I do think uh, that you're probably speaking to is a whole different entity. And that's in the United States. Um, there's been TV talk shows, uh, et cetera, that have really focused on this 
non-celiac gluten sensitivity. It's different than celiac disease. Right. It's, it's a whole different thing. And in fact, it's more based on the history that if people eat – you know, too much bread or too much pasta or something. I didn't think that could happen, but you can eat too much pasta. It's impossible. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've tried. I'm actively trying. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you, I mean, you're kind of, I feel like you're almost referencing like what the Atkins diet was kind of in the end of the 90s where like the idea of like removing carbohydrates, yeah. or, you know, kind of the food pyramid, Mediterranean diet, kind of like, you know, yeah, so the pasta portion in Italy is a little bit more responsible than, you know, Olive Garden mm-hmm. here in America. Um but I mean, but with the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, it's clear it's been popularized, I think, by some of these talk shows. And the symptoms are relatively vague, and the timing is relatively vague. But it kind of is, is as opposed to celiac disease, where you eat a small amount of gluten and you really have a problem. Uh, with this entity, it's more seems to be proportion related. And there may be other – so so when they tried to uh, look at this scientifically and they, they did these studies in a few places, most people, if you challenge them with gluten, they actually don't get sick. Maybe at the most – the most I've seen is about a third of the people don't feel well and they do these placebo-controlled challenge. So they make you think you're eating gluten and then they record symptoms um, versus um, the other one. So, so it's about true. And in a third of these people, one of the theories is it actually doesn't have a lot to do with the gluten itself. It has to do with – these different um, sugars that are kind of linked with gluten. So there's there's oligo and mono. You might have heard of the FODMAP diet. Uh, so that's fermentable oligo, mono, and diglyceride uh, in polyols. That's what it stands for. Um, and it appears that when people back down on those foods, they have less digestive problems. But there's no kind of um, laboratory test we can do to prove that. So it's really one of those really controversial areas, and it's why it's called a syndrome. We really don't understand exactly what causes it, but it looks like it's totally separate from celiac disease. But a lot of people feel they have it because, you know, they, they, they say, well, what are the symptoms of this? Well, you have a lot of gastrointestinal problems, and we know another syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, is very common. And then they start talking about things outside the gastrointestinal tract like fatigue in brain fog, which, I mean, they're just common symptoms. And in, in, it's very difficult to link those yeah, things together. Being- so I think at least part of what you're struggling with with this, oh, my gosh, everybody seems to be gluten sensitive. It's not really celiac disease. Right. And I think that brain fog and fatigue, I mean, I think that's just being alive in 2023. I was going to say, <laughs> catch me on any yeah, given day. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. You know, I think – and that's something that I, I notice. You have to see it, John. You probably see it in the ER where people come in convinced of self-diagnosis. And, you know, the Midwest, I've been a chef, you know, well, I mean, I've been cooking in restaurants for 25 years and, a, you know, a chef running a restaurant for about the last 12. And the Midwest especially comes in with like, I'm allergic to seafood. And so we have to unpack that one a lot. And it's like, okay, understand um, this has anchovy or this has fish sauce or this has, you know, dried powdered shrimp and kimchi, et cetera. And you start realizing like, oh, actually it's not, it's not an allergy. I just don't like it. <laughs> and we we have I mean there and you know I have family members I'm we are very we take chefs take allergies very seriously probably one notch below doctors I mean we, we you know we take it we know that there are people that can can die if they eat certain things so we take it wildly serious but you know at any given moment if you're looking out at a restaurant full of 200 Midwesterners eating at let's say whatever steakhouse or something I guarantee that there's probably 25 individuals that are expressing an allergy in that room at any given moment. You'll, I'll have 20% of the dining room sometimes saying I can't have seafood, even though the science says 3% of the population, et cetera. So the Midwest, I feel like the, the cultural association with food allergies is profound and I think deeply American where somebody's convinced of something and therefore it becomes true instead of like, you know, like you said, I mean, I, I love the data you're just throwing around so casually. It's brilliant because I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data fiend, but if somebody feels like they're allergic to seafood, you can't just say, no, you're not. You know, you have to, you have to take it seriously. But I feel – and I blame, you know, the last 30 years of cooking in Michigan. If you look at like you know, f- there's grocery stores that sell only frozen farm-raised tilapia and orange roughy and, you know, you walk past the, the – f- most people plug their nose when they walk past, you know, a mid-level grocery store seafood section. So, I mean, that, that's, no, that's no way to represent seafood – in the food system. You go to the East Coast, you go to Portland, Maine, I mean every restaurant is serving some kind of seafood and it's and it's lovely and it's fresh and it smells like the ocean. So, so I think when you cook in Michigan, you know, 
seafood is an interesting. I mean, if you if you serve seafood, I get, every chef that's listening right now, I know that every day there's somebody that comes in and says, "I am allergic to seafood." So, you know, I, I think to c- kind of piggyback to your celiac conversation and the gl- slash gluten insensitivity, I think there's so many allergies in America that are more cultural than they are, you know, clinical. And I think that, like John, you have to see some of that when people come yeah. in and tell you something. Like, you know, it probably goes beyond food, too. Yeah. Well, to your points, the uh, food allergies have to be taken seriously in the emergency department because of anaphylaxis, right? An anaphylactic reaction can kill somebody. So once we know we're past that certain critical step in the process of observing somebody and realizing, okay, this is not an anaphylactic reaction, but it's some kind of insensitivity or some type of intolerance, then you start to kind of dig deeper into, all right, what exactly is, uh, is in play here and adding up to this person feeling as though a fish or a shellfish of some sort re- caused this intolerance or, or this reaction. The most common presentation of food allergies in the emergency departments across this country are shellfish. Absolutely in adults is shellfish. In kids, it's peanuts, but uh, for adults, it's shellfish. And from that standpoint, a lot of it is an intense histamine reaction that results in watery eyes, swelling face, itchy skin, redness, blotchy, welts, etc. Now, at the same time, however, there is a mimic that is very common in finned fish such as tuna, uh, skipjack, bonito, etc. And that's called scromboid. Now, scromboid is when you've, quite frankly, when you've got bad fish. Right? So a fresh tuna out of the ocean that's been out of the ocean for four hours and you eat it in a nice sushi restaurant, that's different. It's been sitting in somebody's fridge for four days or a week and then you're presenting it and eating it in a fashion, whether it's cooked or not, what happens in the tissue of that fish is histamine builds up. And so histamine does not get eradicated out of the food when you cook it. It stays in there. So regardless of how you prepare it after it's sat for a while, it can be bad And it gives you a reaction that's very similar to a mild allergic reaction. Red, itchy skin, swollen eyes, watery eyes, you know, itchy mouth, et cetera. And uh, and that's called a scromboid reaction. So poor quality gives you a similar reaction to an actual allergy. That's exactly correct. it's not an allergy. That is correct. You're eating the histamine, your body's not creating it. Yep. So to your point, in the Midwest, those fish are not necessarily native at all. To our region. Right. And so those fish have traveled a certain distance or may, perhaps have sat in somebody's fridge for a longer period of time than maybe you'd get it on a coast or, you know, in L.A. or New York, et cetera. And therefore, perhaps, again, I'm this is somewhat conjecture, yeah, respect, respect but at the same time, um, people in the Midwest may more likely be exposed to those type of reactions and those types of food preps or food uh, that's going to cause this kind of reaction. And so that locks in a certain memory of, hey, I was in this restaurant. Yeah. I had this awful reaction that sometimes ended up in the emergency department. And I think histo- so therefore it's an allergy. Historically in Michigan, you know, if you look at like 30, 40 years ago, I think that, you know, a lot of the dining community is, you know, 50s, 60s uh, in Southeast Michigan. And if you look at yeah, I mean, I think historically the restaurants and nowadays there's I mean, there's so much technology getting products around the world faster. But yeah, if you look at the grocery store supply chain 35, 40 years ago, it was not what it is today. Correct. You know, cryovac wasn't even really plentiful like it is today. So that's profound. And you know, I always I always joke. I always tell people like, look, I'm I'm allergic to bad fish too. Joking, but who knew that that was actual some science, <laughs> an actual thing. <laughs> yeah, wow. That was yeah, that was. That, this, I'm learning so much. I'm like my head spinning. John, I want to just comment on this frequency that you see, particularly with seafood, et cetera. Um, So one of the problems that we have in the United States is testing for allergy is probably way overdone. In fact, a few years ago, the American Board of Internal Medicine had this program called Choosing Wisely. And one of the first things they said is, please don't test to foods that don't make any sense that the patient had an allergic reaction because the rate of having a positive test is much higher than true allergy. So this sensitization process is the first step. But just because you're sensitized does not mean you're going to have a clinical response right. whatsoever. Right. So a lot of the people that you're seeing, uh, depending on physicians they may have saw, they sometimes order this thing called a food allergy panel for whatever reason. And in, in my experience, sometimes there, there's very little reason, but it was ordered. And a lot of those will come up with positive responses to, say, shrimp. 
And in fact, the protein that we test both by skin testing as well as in the, the blood test for shrimp can cross-react with common things that people are allergic to like dust mite, like cockroach. So there's shared proteins in, in uh, shrimp. It's tropomycin. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a similar found in the gut of uh, cockroach and as well as in dust mite. So if you're just allergic to those things, which are really, really common allergens, as you know, um, you may test positive to shrimp. And it's the same thing with many foods in pollen. So there's this cross-reactivity uh, between certain pollens. So in people who are birch allergic, a pretty good percentage of people will notice when they eat a fresh apple that their mouth itches. They have all sorts of problems. And again, that's cross-reactivity between the apple um, uh, and birch pollen. Now, thank God, most of those people don't have anaphylaxis. and It maintains really just local reactions. Mouth, but those are really, really common type problems. And there's a lot of foods that cross-react with the pollens as well. But there's a, a big difference between just having this positive test and then having a clinical problem with the food. And you'll hear, you, you will hear, you know, holistic approach being like eat your local honey, eat raw natural honey, you're consuming the pollen, softens your allergies and hay fever for the season. Is there some truth in there or is that snake oil? I hate to say it's snake oil, <laughs> but I, 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 I would say that I haven't seen any scientific okay. studies right. that suggest that that would be helpful. All right. <laughs> There's not a lot of rom romance in your scientific community. <laughs> We'll be right back, right after this. Black perspectives haven't always been centered in the telling of America's story. Now, we're taking center stage. Introducing NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of Black-led stories from NPR's podcasts. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths, wherever you get your podcasts. So uh, one theory I'm going to put forth, not backed by scientific data, this is just me being a chef, but I feel like a lot of the allergies in America uh, especially the ones that are self-diagnosed are connected to weight loss. I th or, you know, aversions, I'd say, probably more than allergies. But the dietary restrictions people put upon themselves a lot of times are attached to weight loss. I even have a crazy theory that Ozempic is softening the gluten trend. I feel like people are like, oh, well, I can lose weight more conveniently than stopping eating pizza and bread. <laughs> so do you, see, and do you see any correlation or has anybody even looked at America's obsession with weight loss and our food trends with our aversions and allergies. So I only know this as uh, from a weight gain perspective. So I think there's some social studies or at least some observational type of uh, population studies that say or that would see uh, where food allergies or food intolerance are quite heavy perhaps you have a certain amount of weight gain or obesity trends in those populations as well. And it's not that the two are directly linked. It's that this insensitivity or intolerance creates a certain subjective feel of your body where I'm not going to exercise. I feel bloated. I feel run down. I feel fatigued. And therefore, I don't exert myself or I have a trend to not quite exercise because some of this food makes me feel bad. Mm -hmm. Again, conjecture from the standpoint of these social things being related, but nonetheless, that's that's what I've understood on some levels as well. Yeah, people can be allergic to exercise. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've right. seen it. I've experienced it. Well, I had an allergy to that at one time. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I think as a, as, as a chef, for me, I think what we eat, you know, either, you know, either, either, either fuels us, feeds us, or kills us. I mean, it's really um, the correlation between our health and our diet. I mean, it's, it, it, I don't think we need to prove that in this conversation. But I feel like you see people, that's the first place they kind of like mediate or triage like what is going on. Like cancer patients, for instance, Switching over to vegan is very common. I, we do a lot of vegan cooking, vegan month, et cetera, and a lot of my vegan following are very health conscious, breast cancer survivors, people who have had, you know, um, life-changing illnesses and then, you know, cholesterol, you know, like like toxic level cholesterol, like my doctors can put me on a pill for the rest of my life unless I do some – change something. And I've watched them benefit. You know, usually weight loss, cholesterol, that's pretty easy to prove. Um, but I feel like 
there's a lot of people trying to self-diagnose and, and fix things that maybe the food system or maybe the environment or just the, you know, just the habits and trends. I feel like food is kind of like such an important metric that they can kind of lever up and down. So I have my obviously hair, you know, hair-brained ideas that um, gluten and weight loss are kind of linked. I see that a lot. Not celiac. I definitely, I recognize that. But what you mentioned, like it's kind of a, it's a pop culture thing at this point where it's like everybody knows about, everyone has someone in their family that's not eating gluten. I mean, everybody. Mm -hmm. And you said 1% of the population. Well, that's not everybody. Yeah. Why isn't there seemingly as many allergies in other countries or even in lower incomes? Is that testing like you mentioned earlier? Um, I actually looked up that question because there is definitely variability from country to country. Uh, and one of the, the papers I looked at, a really uh, kind of well-known one published in a very reputable journal, suggests that they, they like scored, again, on epidemiologic uh, basis, um, where the U.S. was with other countries. And actually, the United Kingdom was highest. Uh, the United States was sixth most frequent out of the 15 um, that they checked. And actually, Australia wasn't in this, but when you look at the pediatric-type studies, Australia has a very, very large amount of infants who develop um, allergy to milk in peanut, um, more than the United States. I think it was like triple what the rate is in the United States. And again, there may be reasons. We talked a little bit about uh, genetics, but there's also um, the environment as well. And there's also diet rates of breastfeeding, uh, that type of thing. So probably all those things play a little bit of a role in the variation between um, countries. What I did find uh, interesting is um, the Asian communities often had low levels until they migrated to places like um, Australia, and suddenly um, they were having more food allergies as well, very similar to what we talked about with the peanut allergy, where the children in Israel, because of an exposure, because of this peanut protein early in life, didn't seem to be developing the peanut allergy. Well, they moved to the United Kingdom, and these same snacks are not available in England. <laughs> um, so there may be some associations with uh, those type environmental factors as well or exposures. And I think it's interesting because you are definitely looking at it through a, you know, your life is viewed through the lens of a doctor. I look at it through, the, you know, I travel for food, so I'm eating six different restaurants a day and constant, you know, constant tours and visiting with chefs. And I think what I, I think my you know, personal experiences, the menu, the catering, the way that the restaurant is framed, there's a way less flexibility abroad, I feel like, like the restaurant that does, you know, like you go to a pho stand in Vietnam, like they don't tell you what's in the pho broth. You can bet that there's a lot of different spices, multiple proteins, different animal products, the, you know, maybe rice noodle, maybe a wheat noodle, like they're not really communicating that to you. And I don't see as much issue with the public, nobody really uh, needs to know or like is is uh, triggered by it. And mm. I think that that's kind of like similar to you know, and I'm, I think I'm thinking mostly in Asia, but even at like you know, you go to like a restaurant in Paris, it's like a four course menu. They don't even it's, they don't even tell you what's on it. It's just kind of food just kind of comes out. I think that America is where you have the heavily modified dining experience everywhere you go. If you don't have complete control, you're you know you're, I mean. I can tell you internally, restaurants, even around here, like the higher end restaurants, they have internal software based on aversions and allergies. They like, if you come in there, they basically have a, a like a, like a fire plan, like an escape route for how to feed somebody who gives them uh, multiple aversions and, and allergies. So, I mean, restaurants have, in America have completely pivoted to accommodating this demographic. Whereas other restaurants abroad, I don't see that as much, or even in grocery stores or labeling requirements and, and so on. Yeah, I, I was reading a few papers on restaurants, et cetera, and early in the millennium, there was major problems about education among whether it was servers or even managers of restaurants. Uh, but I realize that at this point, that's really, I mean, you know, it's, it's your livelihood. You certainly want that allergic person to feel entirely safe in your restaurant. And I mean, that's really the goal, uh, I think, for all of us. But I didn't, I didn't know about these. Spe that's really interesting. I never heard of that. These oh, special sure. programs that, you know, somebody says they're allergic to a given food and you can automatically uh, exclude things. I think that's great. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, I just see that. And it is great. It's, it's really, it's really uh, interesting the way that the restaurant industry in America is pivoting to accommodate and it's to me it's uh, it's 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 evident that that America has a, a deep and serious relationship with aversions and allergies that I don't see as much outside of here. Ed, comment on uh, how social determinants of health may play into this in any kind of way. Um, 
Well, we do know, again, mechanism not known, um, but in the United States, uh, the non-white populations actually have higher rates. I, I, I think uh, before you talked about maybe low rates, but actually um, higher rates than the Caucasian population. Uh, but perhaps in the United not States. diagnosed. What? But perhaps not diagnosed. Well, again, unless it's an emergency sometimes. Yeah, mo most of what I've seen have, again, unfortunately been survey data, which can be all, all um, sorts of messed up yeah. when, yeah. You, really, when like, you really look you, at it. You mentioned UK... The United States, Australia, those are majority Caucasian populations, though. So, I mean, are we, are we, is the data show only where we're pointing the camera? Is that kind of like well, if you if you want to get um, again into other countries, in particular African nations, their environment is so much different than ours. Um, so, we talked a lot about. Um, breastfeeding and vaginal birth, um, but just your local environment. So in the United States, and this more comes from the literature on another allergic disease, asthma, uh, but your environment is very important. And having a place like Detroit where everything is uh, pretty much cement, you know, very few plants, very little grass, almost no soil, um, is a lot different than your living experience uh, in Africa. So some of these soil organisms Again, going back to the gut microbiome are very important because they drive immune development um, uh, early in life. So it's not just um, those factors that we talked about, but the environment in the air and in the soil and what you're exposed to. And actually, a lot of our data has to do, believe it or not, with dogs decrease the likelihood of sensitization having them in your home. So these very diverse bacterial exposures may be very important, again, particularly very early in life. I will definitely be cherry picking so much of this conversation for the rest of my life. I'll be like, see, dog, dogs that keep you alive longer. Right? <laughs> right. You can eat more. You can eat gluten if you have a dog. <laughs> I didn't say that. I know you didn't, but I did. And I will be cherry picking that. You know, I just. <laughs> oh. Um, couple, cu couple quick ones that probably are a little bit less in depth. The seed aversion with diverticulitis. I, that we get that occasionally. That seems to have been ruled out by the medical community. Correct. So is that – so like people – some people still cling to it. Maybe, and, you know, maybe it's worked out for them, so I never want to take that away. I don't, I don't have a, you know, a, too strong an opinion of it, but th that has been ruled out yeah. by, by the medical I, community. Knowing the way our large intestines or colons form diverticula and how seeds then transit through our GI tracts, if you think about the physiology and the anatomy – uh, you could jump to a conclusion that there's something there, but there are no scientific studies that actually say eating cucumbers or tomatoes or seed-based anything, uh, popcorn, uh, sunflower seeds, et cetera, are going to result in the development of diverticulitis for people who have diverticulosis. Nightshade allergies. That seems to be um, a, it's a really interesting one for me because, I mean, nightshades, to people that don't know, it's a large group of vegetables – um, I guess, you know, it's fruit, fruit as well. So, I mean, like tomato and peppers, technically fruit. Um, but what is with the nightshade? What is, how is someone allergic to nightshade? Okay, well, right. again, there may be multiple mechanisms to that. So there, there have been some studies that, though, that show that there are some specific proteins uh, that are in the nightshade family that you can be allergic to just like you can to some of these common foods. But it's, it's thought to be very rare. Um, with other ones, particularly like tomato and potato, we talked a little bit about cross-reactivity between pollen in the air. And those are foods that you can have what's called the food pollen allergy syndrome or oral allergy syndrome where they make you itch. So people may be getting those ideas. In the nightshades, and, and again, you know, when I was way back in pharmacy school a long time ago, we learned all about the deadly nightshade or, or belladonna. So, so I mean, they're, they're related to those plants. And, and one of the ways they're related is they certainly don't have the toxic pharmacologic properties like the deadly nightshade has, uh, but they do have alkaloids in them as well. And those are very biologically active. So um, if you consume enough or maybe if you're prone to having those types of reactions, they can certainly give you gastrointestinal problems as well and maybe even some flushing and those types of things. Um, so, so there may be cross-reactivity. I don't view, in fact, I don't see a lot of people, people sometimes tell me, oh, you know, potatoes make my mouth itch and I can assume that's a oral allergy. But I don't see a lot of what would be anaphylaxis like John C's. And yeah, I was going to say, is that – you don't see – okay, so anaphylactic nightshade is not necessarily uh, it's, known or – It exists. Okay. It's extremely rare. Okay. Can you actually be allergic to onions and garlic? Yes. Like anaphylactic. 
Yes. Again, very rare. And mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever actually, I've never seen an anaphylactic reaction to it, but nonetheless, that's my own singular, singular experience yeah, of course. in that. But, uh, cause I, I have to, I mean, in, 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 in modern, you know, European cuisine based cultures, that has to be just everything that is, I mean, that's when someone comes in and says allergic to onions, that's always like, wait a second, like hold them at the door. Like what kind of, <laughs> what kind of allergic, like we can, we can leave exactly. things out. But I mean, onions and garlic, the alien family is just in every kitchen. Yep. So again, extremely rare, incredibly rare to be anaphylactic uh, from uh, those two uh, types of foods, which is again, a cross reactivity, a similar protein in those two foods. Uh, but for the most part, the majority of I'm insensitive to garlic or onion are secondary to just the way it makes your body feel yeah. for some people who are sl- somewhat dietary intolerant to it. Are you guys participating in, aware of, or interested in the research with uh, GMOs in American cuisine? You following this at all? Not not an area I know a lot about. Yeah, neither. So the medical community is not keeping too close an eye on GMO and and kind of uh, monocropping and kind of the way agriculture is changing? So from the standpoint of highly processed foods, introduction of various types of preservatives and chemicals and things that simply make the food supply last longer or more um, diverse or from the standpoint of uh, able to be used across multiple different utilizations, that I've seen things linked to the fact that it's the introduction of these foreign proteins in a Western diet that then has developed some of these insensitivities. But other than that, yeah, that's about as deep as I go there. Let's end another podcast. We'll get crazy. We'll get <laughs> we'll get someone that's not a doctor in to just you know just to, to get you real need, to get need, real weird. You need Oliver Stone in here. Yeah, yeah, we'll get real weird real fast. Um, <laughs> uh, are there any foods or food preparations that you guys stay, are afraid of? Stay away from any you know like anything that whether it's just superstitious or you're just like you've seen too much, you know too much. I'm assuming you don't smoke cigarettes. A couple of doctors, guys shouldn't smoke. But is there any foods you're afraid of? No, I don't. I don't think so. Good um, attitude. I like that. Uh, no, I I'm, unfortunately that's one of my problems. I haven't met a food I don't <laughs> like. But um, yeah, I mean, when you say afraid of, I always think of what John sees. So right. yeah, if if people tell me they had a shellfish reaction right away, my ears prick up. We got to make sure we have to make a definitive diagnosis because. Uh, the consequences of letting them expose themselves again uh, are major when it comes to some other foods that are very, very unlikely um, and some that have pharmacologic properties like we talked about with the nightshades or even the garlic and the onions. They they do have things that, I mean, they upset people's GI tracts. So you could pretty much put those away. But there's not like a specific food. I go, oh, gosh, don't eat that. Because for you, I'm saying. For you. For me? No. Oh, gosh, no. You <laughs> So like you know, you a couple beers, you go and have a fast food, no problem. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Old pizza been sitting out for six hours, yeah. and still eat a slice. Hot dog on the roller. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Just yeah. making sure. I mean, for me, it is uh, well. Like I've told you many times, you are the professor of my school of food, and so uh, I've learned how to tolerate many, many different <laughs> types of food. But at the same time, for me, it really gets to bad fish. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. It's mm. ironically enough, it is. You can smell it. Mm-hmm. You you know when. A piece of fish, I'm ready to eat it versus, yeah, I'm going to pass on that one. Totally. I mean, I've been in a lot of situations uh, abroad where you're like, you just have to trust your caveman instincts and be like, nope, I'm going to politely decline. I probably steer away from brains, secondary to prion disease and things like that. Really? Yeah. I, I've eaten a lot of brains. You don't eat brains? I don't eat brains. No. What, ex- why? Uh, just, just. Is it like emotional or is, it, is, it, is there something in there? That no. So, you know, this is g- getting way off course, but. You know, prion disease and things that will result in your death, and there's no way to reverse that whatsoever. I'm steering clear of those kind of things. Interesting. All right. We oh, eat. note, to, eat. note <laughs> to self there, James. Got to eat less brains. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> well, that's a good way to wrap this that's up. About, <laughs> my, that's about my, the only one on my list, though. <laughs> my last question for you, though, is besides anaphylactic, what is, and it can be cooking related, too, what is the most common kitchen slash food emergency ERC, at least in you know in the Midwest where you've worked, yeah. what is the most common? It's shellfish allergies. Besides that, kitchen what like is it cuts, burns? Oh, like, oh okay. So kitchen other, injuries, like, other food related injuries. Oh, for sure. Okay, so the um, any emergency physician uh, can tell you the stories of working on Thanksgiving uh, or any <laughs> other major food holiday, 
and the types of uh, injuries. Uh, it's humans versus turkeys on that day, and a lot of times the turkeys win. Wow. So Thanksgiving is an you, ER. A lot of times you'll see people, you know, cutting fingertips off, bad lacerations on their hands, um, taking the turkey, a big heavy turkey out of the <laughs> oven with a floppy foil pan that's full of grease, yes. and they trip and fall, and the thing spills on them, and they burnt all down their abdomen and their legs. Wow, you you so, can see it all. So Thanksgiving yeah. is kind of like— Thanksgiving is an incredibly uh, frequent food injury type of day in emergency departments. So the ER doctors and the Detroit Lions, like that's, the, that's their big day. You got it. You got it. <laughs> well, I have yeah. a son-in-law who's a firefighter, and the other big thing is uh, when they do the turkey Fry, frying yeah. type yes. issues. Yes. <laughs> their house is on fire. Their <laughs> clothes are on fire. Exactly. So I would, I would highly recommend to any listener, if you're going to fry a turkey this Thanksgiving, practice with your fryer in terms of how much oil to put in that thing before you actually dunk that turkey <laughs> because good advice. it requires so much less oil in those things than you would think. And as soon as that overflows, yeah, it's over. you've got an inferno in your garage. It's so over. it's over. Well, thank you so much. This is, this is great. Beyond educational. Um, I appreciate the time and the, and the energy and, the, and all the research you put into my, to my crazy list of questions. Love it. But thanks, gentlemen. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. It's uh, been a huge privilege. Thank you guys so much for having yes, us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Essential Cooking. If you've been enjoying our show, please drop us a review and share it with a friend. This podcast is produced by me, and Delisi, with my co-host, James Rigato. This episode was also produced, engineered, and edited by Connor Anderson, with production support from David Lyons, original music by the Mallet Brothers. Essential Cooking is a production of WDET, Detroit's NPR station.